All right, guys, we're back on the Kevin and Fred show. And today I am joined by Brian Charlesworth. Brian, how's it going today, man? Awesome. How are you doing, Kevin? Doing really good. And uh, we're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pronounce this uh, hopefully correctly. Sisu, is that the name of the company? Is that, or I should say, is that the correct pronunciation of the company? As far as I know, that's the way I pronounce it. You know, it's actually a Finnish term. So uh, I, I don't know if I even know how to pronounce it, but that's how I pronounce it. Here's the deal. I, I'm always like concerned with company names and last names, especially with company names, say like being a technology. Um, sometimes there's missing vowels. Almost always there's missing vowels. And I'm like, crap, I'm going to say this wrong. So I always figure might as well just ask first. But at any rate, Brian, I'm super excited to do this podcast with you today. We, You and I got to record a podcast not that long ago where uh, I was the one on the hot seat and you were the one at peppering with questions and it was awesome. We, we flowed for quite a while. It was a really good conversation. I, at least I enjoyed it. Um, and so I'm excited to kind of run this back and talk to you about your business and kind of your past and what makes uh what makes you tick yeah i'm i'm excited so excited. Let, i hope you don't put me quite as much on the hot seat as i put you in but who knows uh, other we'll than see. that i'm excited uh, <laughs> we'll see how it goes man no so uh, let's do this let me start here and I, I like to do this with everybody if you know what's the two minute elevator speech for someone says hey hey brian what do you do um tell me like how, how do you answer that question for the people who maybe don't know you or, or don't know what Sisu is or hadn't heard of it yet? When someone asks you, what do you do? How do you, how do you typically respond to that? So when you say, what do we do? You're saying, what does Sisu do? Yeah. And then I want to yeah. dive into Brian and, and, and kind of your roles and, and history along that. But with someone, you know, you run into somebody in the, I don't, literally in an elevator and they say, Brian, you know, what do you, you know, it's nice to meet you. What do you do? How do you typically respond to that? Yeah, so, I mean, we we tagged Sisu as a growth automation software because, and that, that didn't exist, right? Kind of like CRM didn't used to exist. And why did we do that? Well, everything that we do is either focused on the growth of your business or automating your business. So, and a, a couple of examples of that would be, you want to grow? Well, first thing you're going to do is set goals. Then you're going to track those goals. Then you're going to do that for each of your agents. And then you're going to have gamification and you're going to have leaderboards up in your offices, all those kinds of things. So that's all the sales performance growth side of things. And then the automation side of things is more along, hey, do the same thing with your operations team, right? How do you manage that side of your business? Do you have systems in place for every task they need to get done? Do you have automations that go out to let people know of reminders so they don't miss debt? you know, diligence deadlines and that kind of stuff. You know, all those types of things. Do you, can you do your commissions with a click of a button or are you still doing your commissions by filling out a spreadsheet that I've found that in working with a lot of customers, many times those spreadsheets are off, right? I mean, we've, we've told people, do you realize you've been doing your commissions wrong for the last five years? They're like, really? Yeah, my agent should have been paying four thousand dollars more towards the cap but i was paying their cap because i was doing in the pre-splits you know just stuff like that so anyway uh but that's that's the two minutes that's the two minute pitch awesome so okay so now here's where we start to go backwards have you is that kind of been your space like the software game for a long time or or real estate tell me tell me kind of how do you even get into that it's a great question so software is my passion the most fun i've had before this company was building a company that we sold back in 2003. It, we started it in 98, so it's been a while. Sign of age right there. Uh, that company was the first voice internet browser, if you will. So the stuff that Siri does yeah. and Google, Alexa, right? The stuff they were doing, we were doing it 20 years ago. The difference is we were, we were obviously ahead of our time. Uh, it was a battle at that time. The internet was so new. It was a battle of, are people going to choose to visually go in and do this with these devices? And at that time, you know, the devices weren't what we have today, right? An iPhone didn't exist. Yeah. Um, or are they going to do it with their voice? And the visual side of it, if, for those of you who are watching, the visual side, right? That one. And then now 
it's we want even more convenience, which was my vision. And so that's that's coming up. So anyway, that's kind of how I got into tech. Um, I've, I've loved tech forever. Uh, after we sold that business, I became a franchisor for a while in 2008. I bought Housemaster Home Inspections. We had, you know, 200 locations across North America at the time. We built it to about 430 locations across North America. And then uh, I, I bought about one company a year for about eight years. And then I ended up partnering with Budget Blinds to acquire some businesses underneath them. And we sold that. And when we sold that, my wife basically said, well, you're figuring out what you want to do next. Come help me build my real estate team. And so I committed to do that for a year or two. <clears throat> and about six months in, I just saw a huge, huge gaping hole that, you know, this industry needed because most of the industry is not tech savvy enough to really roll out their own set, their own sales force. So sales force, you know, in, in this industry, it's really different. A CRM in this industry is not a data storage hub, which is what Salesforce is, that you can build any report you want and you can get anything, you know, access to any information you want. A CRM in real estate is more of a, I'm going to generate a lead for you through this IDX website, and I'm going to give you the means to follow up uh, and make sure you're following up on those leads. But once you get an appointment scheduled, like most CRMs in real estate, kind of become, you know, they're not as valuable at that point, right? So you need another system to manage it from that point to close and even beyond close, right? What do you do after close? You pull a sign out of the yard, you, you know, get a key box off, you, you know, stuff like that or agent onboarding task, right? The agent onboarding task, not something you can do in your CRM. So something you should do with a, you know, data storage hub like CSU that's meant for real estate. Yeah. So, so that, that thought process, obviously, you know, kind of hearing your background, that clearly comes pretty, um, I would say natural to you. It sounds to me like that's, that's sort of the way your mind works. Like you, you approach things, uh, from a software standpoint and automation and a, Clearly, anybody who's worked any sort of time in a real estate business can go, oh, yeah, there's not a whole lot of that around here, right? Even today, here we are recording this in uh, 2021. It's still, there's there's quite a few, uh, you talked about spreadsheets, you know, for for commissions. And I was going to say, I almost picked up, you know, my sticky note pad. Like, I know there's plenty of people still running businesses off of sticky notes, quite frankly. Um, yeah. Because we are such a kind of antiquated as an industry overall. I mean, here here's the thing that gets me is... This and this is just like my pet peeve. If you're putting something into a spreadsheet or if you're putting something into a Trello board, that data is dead data at that point. What do I mean by that? Well, you can't really generate any reports. You can't integrate it into other systems. You can't, like it's usually 99% of the time, it's, it's duplicate data entry. Like, do you really want duplicate data entry or do you want to just have everything in one place, all reporting at your fingertips? Um, and like even Trello, Trello and Monday.com, I think they're phenomenal products, platforms, whatever you want to call them. That being said, if you're in real estate and you're managing your contract to close process, if you already have all of that data in a system, why not have that system do all of that so it can notify you of every trigger, every date that you need notified of that you can trigger some other task off of everything happening versus having to go into a spreadsheet and then into Trello and then into something else and something else like that's just that's too much for me. <laughs> no doubt. Um why, so why do you, why do you, I, I know I have my opinions, but like, why do you think that is such a big need in real estate or, or maybe a better way to put this would be, why do you think that is the case in real estate that we are, there is so much duplicate entry and, you know, using of spreadsheets and I'm going to say antiquated as an industry. Yeah. You know, most of the, you know, 15 years ago when a lot of these companies that, started here i'll take lone wolf as an example go back 25 years ago or however many years ago that was like when they started doing commissions 
I don't think APIs existed at the time, right? None of them, and even most of the CRMs, early stage CRMs in real estate, like when they came into real estate, there was no, nothing in their mind of saying, I'm going to have to communicate with another platform. Um, and, you know, in, in real estate, it's, it's an industry where people don't want to spend a ton of money on a, on a system, right? I mean, yeah. I have a friend who, and an advisor, basically my SaaS advisor, who used to work for Pluralsight. He's now the CEO of his own SaaS business called Schmoop. Uh, which is an educational platform um, based in Arizona. But he, he basically told me when we started building Sisu, he said, anybody in the software space would pay you five to $600,000 a year for what you guys are doing. But if you think about it in real estate, I mean, we're charging like 250 bucks a month on average, something like that, you know, not very much, right? So it's like, geez, to go build this, you know, you could go build this on your own for five, six million dollars, or you could just rent it for a couple hundred bucks a month, right? <laughs> what do you want to do? You tell me. So I know you spent at least 30 grand building out your own platform. Miss it a zero. I mean, what kind of yeah. experience was that for you? Uh, it's painful and I still wake up with, uh, with night sweats occasionally, uh, thinking about it, you know, absolutely. You know, we're, we're probably into a little, little, little North of 300 and, um, yeah, I don't, I don't own a software company for a reason, you know, I mean that, that needs to, it was just, it was painful. I'm going to just say it that I'll just leave it at yeah. that. It, it's painful, but so, so here's my, but here's my question for you though thinking about what your friend said to you about, you know, if you were, if you were doing this for other software companies or, you know, other industries, I should say, they'd pay you obviously significantly more money. Why, why is it? Why do you think that the, I'm going to say the perceived value is so low in the, in the terms of uh, real estate, like agents and brokers, like, why do you think that is? I just think it's a different business. I mean, so let's take your average team owner. Let's, let's take you, you're a little kind of, you're kind of unique because when you came, I know this from interviewing you, but when you came into the industry, like after a very short time, you were building a business, but most people spend years selling real estate. True. And then they get to a point where, Hey, I'm a really good real estate salesperson or realtor, right? I, I sell 50 plus homes a year, I'm going to start a team. I'm going to teach other people how to do this. Well, so that's their process. So how do they get from that to, yeah, I'm going to go spend 10, 20, 30 grand a month on software. They don't, right? I mean, they don't get there. So the reality is, is they're, learning more and more and more. And I mean, there's some really, really sharp minds in real estate. That's one of the things I love about it. People like you that are like, just all about learning and growing and sharing. And so, you know, what I love is bringing something to this industry that turns a salesperson into a really, really great leader. So that they can now manage their business with systems, they can manage their sales team with numbers, with conversion ratios, with, you know, percent to goal with, instead of, you know, I, I've, I've seen so many one-on-ones that, that were managing somebody's emotions rather than managing, managing their, them to meet their goals, right? It's all about, it's not about your goals, right? As a leader, it's, yep. it's nothing, they could care less what your goals are. What they care about are their goals. So if you, I call that positive accountability. All you're doing is finding out where they want to be and you're helping them figure out what it's going to take to get there. And you're, you're meeting with them about that once a week. Yeah, it's kind of. And, and breaking down where their weaknesses are so that you can train them so that those become their strengths. I mean, it's really that easy. Yeah, it's um, being able to kind of, I always, the way I would explain it to people is 
the real estate industry, people see this as, you know, all commission is very unpredictable, but the truth is your income is extremely predictable. If you know how to predict it, if you know the numbers, the things that go into predicting the income. And so once you can get a, a stranglehold on those numbers, those, indi those key indicators um, that lead to the income 60, 90, sometimes, you know, 180 days down the road, it's, it's extremely predictable, but it's a matter of knowing, knowing what activities drive those, knowing what, what, what indicators drive the actual uh, income once, once you get further down the road. Yeah. And I, I, you know, it's been a long time coming for, for this industry, for people to, to recognize that and more and more and more people every day recognize that and recognize that, wow, I can, I can, I can double my business possibly by doing that. Is that worth a couple hundred bucks a month? Now our software alone is not going to double your business, but if you use it effectively as a leader, it will. Yeah. Right. So it's about, but I mean, the software is about understanding your business and uh, like literally learning the key metrics where things are at and where you're going. And in a lot of cases where we've been, one thing I've noticed, and this is just in conversations I've had with, you know, th tens of thousands of conversations I've had with realtors all around the country, really around the world is n I, I came across so many realtors who don't understand where they've been, meaning they have a certain result and they're actually not even real sure about how they got it. They think they know how they arrived uh, or where most of their business comes from. And the truth of the matter is they really don't when you, when you go dive into the results of it. And it's, it's, it's scary to see how big some of these incomes and businesses can get without truly understanding it. So that's a, that's such a great example. I'm glad you brought that up. So just that little thing of, Hey, I spend 20 grand a month on Zillow. Okay. What's your return? I don't know. Okay. So let's figure that out first. Oh, well, I'm spending 20 grand a month. We're closing 23 grand a month in transactional volume, you know, in, in GCI. Okay. So a lot of people think, okay, that's profit for me. Well, and then you're only getting 50% of that, right? I mean, so, so what are you really getting there? Um, and then you have some decisions to make once you get to that point. And it's, it's decisions like, number one, do I want to keep spending this money on this type of lead? Number two, Who's converting them at a higher level? Which agents should I give them to those agents only? Number three, should it be a different commission split? If I was giving them 40% instead of 50% on these types of leads, now what happens to, now does this become profitable for me? So there's a lot of questions you can ask if you know your numbers. There's a lot of pivots you can make if you know your numbers, you can make decisions and this is, for me, this is the, like, this is what drives me is, you know, a New Year's resolution, we make a decision once a year. And within three weeks into the year, here we are, March 1st, today, most of us don't know what our New Year's resolution was. Why is that? Well, number one, we didn't write it down. Number two, we didn't track it daily. If we were tracking it daily, we would still know what it is. And we would probably be on pace or close to be on pace to, to that goal. But if we track it monthly, you know, it's kind of there in the background in our brain, but it's not something we're really passionate about. And if we, if we track it yearly, it just truly doesn't even exist, right? And, and then, of course, there's weekly, which sits in between there. And I would say if you have an ops person that's building spreadsheets so that you know your numbers on a monthly basis, you're making decisions once a month. So you can make 12 key pivots per year. Imagine how many key pivots per year you could make if you knew your numbers every day. They were right in front of your face and you had reporting at your fingertips. Yeah, and but it's, 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 it's a big difference. I mean, it's a huge difference maker. Yeah, I mean- Just that's the difference between success and failure. And, you know, this industry that we're in right now, like there's some key decisions to make. I mean, this is the first time I've seen this industry where honestly, I think a buyer's agent today actually needs more skills than a listing agent. Oh, uh, 
undoubtedly right uh, when now. have you ever seen that i mean how long have you been in real estate uh, i've i've had my license now almost for 14 years so i got licensed uh, may of 07 and uh i mean it's the opposite you know i'm in phoenix there was 59,000 homes for sale that at that summer i remember and there's like 5,000 homes for sale today i mean it's wildly yeah. different mm -hmm. it's such an extreme seller's market I would totally agree with you with that saying is right now it does take more skill as a buyer's agent than it does as a listing agent. Absolutely. Not even close. Yeah, if, if you want to have success. So I mean, what better time to be a listing agent, right? <laughs> you, you list a home and it's sold the day it hits the market or, you know, within 24 hours yeah. and with multiple offers and sometimes up to 40 offers. <laughs> Your biggest problem is going to be sifting through the offers. I was on a, uh, I'm on a so kind of a mastermind call every other week, this group of agents um, here in the Phoenix area. And one of them was sharing, he had four new listings go live on Friday. For those four listings, they had 294 showings. This is four listings since Friday, 294 showings. And we're recording this, as you mentioned, March 1st, which is a Monday. Four days, he had 294 showings and I think it was 71 offers on those four, across those four listings. Yeah. So on average, that's, you know what, not quite 20 offers each, but pretty dang close. That's, that's wild. That it takes so much time to sort through that stuff. Like mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it, it, it's crazy. So now the flip side is that, okay, it's a buyer's agent. So only four, only four agents out of the 70 are going to have their clients offer accepted the skill set required to make sure you are one of your your four of 70 to get your offer or one of 20 to get your clients offer accepted that that's hard that's not easy to do yeah it's easier to go take a listing it's so much, <laughs> it's so much easier it's so much a listing easier agent now that's my advice <laughs> yeah yep keep working with your sphere and uh keep working on those skills to become a listing agent because yeah. uh no matter what, having having listed inventory is always gonna gonna play well for you. So so know your conversion ratio from conversations to appointments set, and if it's less than two percent, you need some major major work on your scripts. All right. So let me ask you that. So you said that that two percent number pretty confidently. Like, where does that come from? Tell me tell me about that. Why is it two percent? Just working with. I mean, some agents are as high as eight percent. That's probably as high as I've seen. But honestly, like, if you're gonna be on the phone having conversations with a hundred people. How many conversations can you have a day? Maybe 25? I, I would imagine, yeah, 20 to 25 max. That, yeah. even, even that seems like a lot for me, but you know, I'm, I'm below average for sure. So that, that's somebody that's on a dialer actually having conversation, you know, and I'm talking a real conversation. So at that point, if you're having 125 conversations a week, and if you're not setting at least two appointments, like there's a problem. We need to work on your scripts, right? Totally. So many, so many times people are like, well, I'm just going to have more conversations. No, you're going to, you're going to burn out. Again, this is one of those things, knowing your numbers, you can make a decision. And the decision is, guess what? It's time for me to learn my scripts. It's time for me to start having my scripts in front of me. Every time I'm in a conversation, when I'm in the shower, when I'm, you know, I need to know these inside out and I need to know how to ask better questions and peel that onion back and know when to close. Right. I mean, all those things. Yeah. But, I think that's so great. I'm glad that you use that example. I mean, I think of that, you know, someone who wants to go from maybe, maybe they want to go from a hundred thousand to a million a year, or they want to go from, I'm just breaking into, you know, a hundred thousand is the number I always hear agents kind of throw out, or, you know, people want to get to. And the reality is to your point, like if you're already doing, you know, 125 conversations a week and you want to, to grow your, you know, you want to grow your business, your income from say a hundred thousand to a million, you, there's no room to 10 X the effort. Like you can't, yeah. you can't 10 X your effort in that case. You've, you've got to 10 X your results, which means you've got to get smarter. And if you're going to get smarter about it, you need to have the insight. You need to have the, literally the business intelligence. You need to have the insight into what's really happening in my business to get me the results I'm looking for and, and sort of work backwards from there. And I think what that was your point is like, Hey, with, with the whole, one of the main functions of CISO is to help you 
to be able to do that easily. Yeah, if you if you if you don't have that insight, like you said, there's nothing there for you to be able to know what you can do different. There's nothing for you as a team leader to know what your you can teach your agents to do different, right? Which agent is struggling in which areas? Where are their low conversion ratios? If you could just look at it, look at a dashboard and see for that agent. Oh, on the listing side, this is where they're, the listing side, they're really struggling. They're going out on four appointments. They're getting one. They have a 25% conversion ratio. I know what to work on, right? I and mean, you can just look at it and, and know in seconds, this is what we're going to work on. I'm going to get you in the next two weeks. I'm going to get you from here to here. And that's going to change your world. Yeah. You know, I'd always, it's funny. So I'd always talk with the agents on, in our organization around our key metric that we would track would be appointments set, appointments held, how many of those then signed, you know, or hired us, and then how many of those closed. Because if I know those, I know where my problems are, right? I know that I've got to have, and, and again, for us, it showed up over the, over a number of years and thousands and thousands of appointments was if I had, if, if we as a company set 10 appointments, we know that seven of those were actually held so again, not everyone shows up, people cancel, people no show, seven of them got held, five of those seven hired us. And so I knew that if I was not getting seven out of 10 showing up, then I was a problem with my scripting on, yep. on how to get the people, like I was setting appointments I really shouldn't be setting. And then if they were showing up and not hiring me, then I knew my problem was during the conversation, during that consultation. Then, and then if I was getting five of the seven to show up, but wasn't having two to three of those clothes within a 12 month time frame, then I knew that my problem was I was, I was working with people who weren't really qualified, ready to go buyers or sellers. And so there was something else there. There's a different part of the process where I've got to tweak, but you can't know those things unless you know, to your point, the whole point of your conversation is, is no, you've got to know those numbers. So you can get really intelligent about where to focus your time or where to focus your training, your mentorship, et cetera. Yeah. And, and I would say it's the same thing on the op side. Like, let's say you have a couple of TCs. Do you have any idea how many tasks they're checking off at a time? Like a month? How, how, many, how many tasks or how many transactions can each of your TCs work through a month? And how many tasks, what, what are the systems that they should be doing in a contract to close? Do you really have that documented and all in one place where it can be checked off and you can just go look at it and know in a heartbeat where your ops team is? Or is that something that you're just trusting that they're doing what they need to do on the whiteboard and they'll get through it? And, you know, uh, you know, how you have the tape boxes up on the whiteboard, right? Where you see oh, yeah. the checkbox in it. And then you go from 30 transactions, which is the most that will fit on that whiteboard to 60. So now you need two whiteboards. And then when you go over 60, you're like, okay, what am I going to do here? We can't handle any more than this. I'll just, I'll pull back my marketing. <laughs> Hashtag never say that. Um, <laughs> never, never do that. So what, okay. So what, <laughs> let me ask you this conversation. Cause yeah, you that was sarcasm. If you don't know. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. For anybody who missed that, that was definitely heavy yeah. sarcasm. Um, so what's, let me ask you this. Like, so you're having conversations with, with real estate agents and brokers and business owners in this space. Like what's the biggest obstacle you see that people have, or they think they have to go to go going from the, the post-it note or, or, you know, the whiteboard with the tape on it to really diving into a system, whether it be CC or not, just literally diving into their numbers and getting really clear about their business metrics. I mean, if you don't have systems in place, if you lose your ops team or anybody on your ops team, you're in trouble because you're relying on They've figured out how to do this. You haven't figured it out. They've figured it out. And it's not duplicatable, right? If like everything, if, if you want to be able to have two TCs and close 450, 500 transactions a year, everything needs to be in a system. And you need automations triggering different things. For instance, hey, we have closing in a week. So you guys might be used to looking at some board and saying, oh, I'm going to call this person. I'm going to text this person. And, you know, after 
an hour, I might get a hold of the agent, the, the client, <laughs> the mortgage company, <laughs> the title company, or you could just have a system that communicates with all of them by sending out one message and you're done. And, or maybe that message is even triggered as an automation. It goes out automatically for you seven days before closing because that's what you've asked it to do. And it does that every time, right? So you can see how just that one thing I mentioned, how many hours a month is that going to save you as, a, as an individual? A ton. Let maybe, me just, Leah. Maybe 15, 20? Let me just, let's just jump forward. It's, it's a ton. Um, so, okay, so you sparked something. You, you mentioned about, you said the word duplication. And you've, you you know, we talked about kind of your background in business and, and the different things that you've done prior to CSU. You obviously have a wide range from background in business. Have, do you, have you had like, do businesses really not, are there any businesses that don't need that sort of the ability to duplicate and track? Like, have you, have you, because I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is I think a lot of us as realtors, we have, we wear this badge of, yeah, but I'm different and I don't have to do things that way. And like not, you know, but really do, do any businesses have the luxury of not tracking and not having things that are duplicatable and just done every time? At least most, not at, at most, the expense. most businesses track and know their numbers. Yeah. Uh, especially successful businesses. Like in today's economy, you really can't be a successful business and not do that, which is why I wanted to bring it to the real estate world. I mean, my wife is in this world. That's how I came across this problem. And, you know, I'm pro agent, right? I want the agent to be around forever and they, I believe they will be. And I want to make them more effective. And in my opinion, what's going to happen over the next few years, and this is just my opinion of this, but those people that have systems and that automate their business and streamline it and do all these things to just make that whole workflow simple. They're the ones who are going to be in business, right? In two years from now, not the people that are just winging it every day. <laughs> that, that doesn't work anymore. Hold on. Are you saying that's not a recipe for success? Just winging it yeah, every single I mean, day? Here's a good example. For those of you, I know we have a lot of Tony Robbins people in real estate. So many of you, most of you have been to at least Tony Robbins Unleash the Power Within. And he talks about, hey, if you're good, like good today is what was horrible 10 years ago, right? I mean, good is, good is less than average. Good is not good. Great now equals what good used to be. So if you're great, you're really good right? I mean, you need to be outstanding. This needs to be perfection. You need to streamline everything. Like you really need to be on top of your game to be the best of the best. There's some really sharp people in this industry. And these are the guys selling three, four, 500, 600, 700, you know, and some of them are doing over a billion dollars a year now in transactions. Which is wild to think about. I, I mean, did, you know, to, Further emphasize that point. I remember, I remember the first time we made it onto the real trends list for like the you know top two hundred and fifty teams in the country. I feel like How we big sold. Were you? Oh, I think we did one hundred and fifty units. I, no, maybe it wasn't even that. Maybe it was one hundred and forty units that year. It wasn't. It wasn't that big. You. Point being, you ba barely even. Like you, you now it's like three, four, 500 units minimum yeah. to make it to that list. Because to your point, the, the bar keeps raising, whether we realize it or not, it's, it's not that we can't be making money right now, this month, this year being not so efficient because you can, you really can, but what's what, but we're not, what you're not seeing is the world around you changing at a rate of speed that is so damn fast. You're not one day you're going to look up and you realize you not only are you no longer keeping up, but you'll never be able to catch up. And, and I, I think that to your point of what you're just sharing what, about, you know, the Tony Robbins conversation, what, what used to be good is like, it's, that's no longer good. And what used to be great is now it's okay. You're pretty good. And yeah. so we've got to continue to raise the bar and get better ourselves. Otherwise we're going to find ourselves it probably in a different business or, you know, at least in a different yeah. role, uh, you know, best case scenario. I mean, I mean, think about it 10 years ago, 
there were not hundreds of teams doing 500 transactions a year. No, there wasn't. There are hundreds and hundreds of teams doing that. And they're doing it. I know because they're on our platform, right? Yeah. And like, if you want to be able to compete, you have to have the systems to be able to compete. Because if you don't, that's what's going to kill you. So many people in this industry, especially today, now that Zillow bought showing time, are afraid of Zillow. But what you really should be afraid of is yourself. Yep. If you're not growing, if you're not improving every day, the industry will leave you behind. Yeah. You know, a point I'd like to add to that, Brian, is you, you don't have to want to sell 700. Uh, this is my belief, okay? This, this is my belief system. You don't have to want to sell 700 or 800 homes a year or 1,000 homes. Cool if you do. And even if you, quote, unquote, only, which, by the way, this is massive in most markets, even if you only sold 50 homes a year, yeah. there's you've got to understand your business at a deep level the same way the person, the guy or the gal that sells 300 and 500 and, and 800 homes a year and 1,000 homes a year. That's right. So just so you're, so you're aware of it, this isn't, you know, one of the things I hate about our industry is it's, it's so much about top line numbers and, and GCI and, and units and volume. And it just so doesn't tell the whole story of what's going on in the business. So I don't want to make it sound like, Oh, you should want to sell 700 homes a year or, or you suck. That's, that's not, I don't think that's the story here, but the, I think the story here is be a better business person. And, and step one to being a better business person is understanding the business and understanding what you have going on in it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> thanks for thanks for sharing that because you can sell 50 homes a year and have a great business. Oh yeah. And have a great life. Or you can not know your numbers, not know your business, not know your systems. And you can sell 50 homes a year and you can be running all over the world and feel like life is just too much and you're so busy and you can't ever go on vacation and you don't ever see your kids and you don't ever, your wife, you know, your relationship with your wife is struggling and all those things. And that's all just because you don't know your business. You don't, you're not streamlining your business. 50 homes a year can be a great business for someone if they're operating, you know, at a high, high, high pace, right? I but, totally agree. Totally agree. Um, all right, let's go into a little, little bit of a lightning round. Like, I just want to pepper you with, with a few questions. Yeah. So you, you brought up, you, like you, so you brought up Zillow and showing time, um, which I think a lot of people are afraid of. And I agree with you. We should probably be afraid of ourselves and not Zillow. But what, okay, next one to two years, what do you see happening in our, in our industry? Like, what do you think is going to be going on two years from today? It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to change. I mean, technology is changing faster and faster. Like right now it changes faster every five years than it changed in a hundred years, you know, 50 years ago. So, so how, what do you do to keep up with that? I mean, things are going to change. What I don't think is going to change is people needing an agent to keep the deal together. <laughs> I mean, I've tried to put a buyer and a seller together and it doesn't work, right? It's like trying to put two negative sides of the magnet together and they just, they just push away from each other. And that deal is not going to happen. I mean, that's part of it is getting it under contract. Part of it is keeping it under contract. So what's going to happen with the industry? I mean, a lot. So Zillow, Zillow is going to move from 70,000 people paying them, in my opinion, to 7,000 teams that they're giving transactions to. Those 7,000 teams are gonna be flex flex teams, right? Yeah. Um, you have OpCity doing the same thing. Realtor.com and Zillow, in my opinion, will be the two largest brokerages in the country. Um, because so many of us are willing to take leads instead of generate leads because we've been spoiled we're entitled, <laughs> you know? So, so I think that's definitely going to happen. And, and, you know, that's, that's what showing time does is it allows them, in my opinion, to have ultimately, they're all about the client being able to do as much as possible. So the client ultimately will be able to, in my opinion, schedule their own showing. So who's going to be the one showing up to that showing? 
So first of all, I'd like to thank you. That was a bold statement. I'll, and I, I, you know, to be able to say that those two companies might be the, you know, would, would be the biggest, two biggest brokerages. Um, I don't think that's that far fetched at all that that's a, that's a real possibility at this point. Um, all right. So what do we do as agents to stop that? Yeah. I mean, I think you need to embrace it and stop it. So what do I mean by that? Number one, everybody in this space needs to keep generating their own leads, right? Yeah. You need to figure out how to create your own business and why not embrace and grow your business by taking advantage of what they can generate for you as well. You just need to know if it's profitable or not and how to make it profitable and which agents to maybe give that. If you have 30 agents, maybe there's only five agents on your team that actually get to work that business because they're the only ones that do a good job of it. So, so, so true. I noticed some jerseys over your shoulder. What, uh, what jerseys are those? I can't quite make them out. So uh, I have Chris Paul back there, Kyrie Irving, John Wall. Um, I have Steph Curry. So kind of a fun story. So you um, want to be like a point guard in your next life? Is that what I'm hearing? So I was, uh, you know, I was a high school point guard, thought I was going to play college ball. And then I ended up breaking this finger in football and it's got a big lump in it. And so I, I had to play basketball left-handed my junior year in high school Ooh. Um, because because of that. So Anyway, my shooting, I never figured out how to get it quite as good as it was. Um, but anyway, I, I coached all of my kids through from kindergarten through 10th grade or ninth grade until they played high school ball. And uh, I'm just really passionate about it. So I, I went through, I got divorced um, in my first marriage about, uh, I don't know, I don't know how long it's been now, but let's just say 10 years, oh, some, somewhere in that neighborhood, right? So um at that time, my son was about eight, nine, my youngest son. Uh, and so, yeah, he's, he just turned 20. So he's probably about nine years old when I went through my divorce. And uh, I decided I was just going to, you know, let him live the dream I wanted as a kid, which was why not go to the NBA games and, and have a, an opportunity to meet all these NBA players and have them sign your jerseys and have them give you their shoes and all that kind of stuff. So we used to go to the jazz games and sit on the front row right by the visitor team's bench. And, uh, you know, so he got to interact with them and he always, he always, he was a point guard. So he always wore or a shooting guard and he always wore the, their point guards Jersey. Cause that's always who he was passionate about. So this is actually my son's collection that you have on the wall back here. I'm storing it for him. Who's your favorite uh, basketball player of all time? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, I know everybody's like Michael Jordan was the greatest player of all time, but, and there are a lot of Kobe haters. There were, I don't think there are any more. I think everybody's grown a new respect for him, but I, I actually, um, I always thought that Kobe like under pressure in the moment, he wants the ball. And, uh, I mean, he lives for that. So I, I would actually say Kobe. Those two, that's my favorite player of all time by, by a mile. Um, and I probably learned more about business and life from Kobe than I did as a lifelong diehard Lakers fan. Um, yeah, you, you and me both, like anybody that can follow his mindset and mentality, you're going to be successful in life, no matter what it is. Oh, you know, yeah. to be the best person on the floor. And to always be the first one in the gym, the last one out. It, it's partially about proving, you know, it's about proving a point. It's about intimidating. It's about getting in other people's heads. There's so much behind that. And you can do the same thing in business. Yeah, uh, it's so true. Um, you know, and with Kobe, like, I, it's funny. I, I had always felt, um, oh, not always, after he retired, I, I had started to get the sense that basketball was going to be like maybe the least significant thing he ever did. And, and from a, and from a pure sports standpoint, even my favorite player ever, I would agree. I think he's the second best player of all time. Personally, I know a lot of people would say, disagree with that and say he's much lower down the list. Other people, yes, yeah, yeah. you just pointed out would agree or say he's, you know, as, as good as Michael, I, I think for me, Michael is number one, but all that to say, it doesn't matter where you rank him. I actually think 
basketball was going to end up being the least significant thing he had ever done yeah. um when it when it came to 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 his legacy and whatnot and to be able to shift from the way he did and the impact he was having on female sports and and what he was able to do in the arts just you can't do it unless you have that mentality that mamba mentality that he always talked yeah. about like that's what it takes so and um, and, and i i would put it for the nba michael did for the nba right i mean yeah he brought the nba to a whole, whole new level of i mean kind of what tiger woods did for golf yep yeah totally um all right favorite favorite activity when you're not working uh what, what do you like to do so it probably depends on the season i like a lot of extreme sports i like a lot of speed so um you know in the winter time i love to ski summertime love to mountain bike love to do like downhill mountain biking um downhill mountain I, biking okay i love to drive cars really fast so i love speed <laughs> What's your favorite car that you either own or have owned? And what's the car that you don't own or never have, but would like to? So it's a good question. I'll put it all in one. So last year I bought a GT3 RS, a Porsche GT3 RS. And that's the car I want to own. And it's the car I do own. Awesome. Very cool. All right. What should we, what should we know about you that we don't know so far? What should I have asked you? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, the only thing you should know about me that you don't know, I guess most people tell me this, but you haven't. So most people call me 007. Uh, that's kind of my nickname because I look like Daniel Craig. So I could see that. All right. I could see that. As soon as you said that, I was like, yeah, that I see it. So Very my daughter, when, when Casino Royale came out, I looked even more like him than I do now. And, uh, my daughter's friends all just started calling me 007 and it's stuck ever since. So, you know, my nickname actually spring also calls me 007 or sometimes she just calls me double O. Oh man. You shouldn't have told me that now I'm just going to call you double O from now on. It's over. It's over, Brian. Um, no more calling you Brian. It's going to be double O double O seven from now on. Yeah. You can call me whatever you want. I like it, man. Well, Hey, uh, obviously. So Sisu is the, What's the best? I'll put the actually forget. It. I'll just put the link in the in the show notes. Someone wants to like catch up with you. Is it should they go to the website? Is it like social? Yes, I mean, by far the best way to learn about Sisu is to go to sisu.co. So again, it's sisu s i s u dot c o. Cool. And if they um, want to learn about you, if they want to learn about 007? Yeah, if they want to learn about me, I mean, I do have a LinkedIn. Uh, it's usually not a great way to get me. I I probably have a hundred messages a day in LinkedIn of people trying to get me. So if you want to reach me, Brian at CSU.co, uh, that will, that'll hit me. Um, and feel free to reach out anytime. I, I mean, I spend a lot of times with team owners, um, agents, broker owners, top industry tech leaders. And, uh, anyway, love spending time because er as much as you guys learn from me, I learn from you. So, uh, love spending time with you guys. Awesome, man. I, Brian, I really appreciate you taking the time out today to do this and uh, looking forward to chatting with you again another time soon. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. All right, guys. We'll see you next week. Have a great rest of your day.